Hi, I'm Jason Hooper from FixYourGut.com, and today we're going to be tackling the topic of hydration. So how much water should we be consuming every day? There's a lot of information out there. Some people will tell you if you're not sipping out of your Hydro Flask every 20 to 30 seconds, then you're dehydrated. If you're not currently urinating, then you're dehydrated. So drink as much water as possible. You know, just liters upon liters of, of water consumption a day has been recommended by a lot of popular health sites. Uh, I'm here to tell you that that could actually be harmful for you and that you should probably understand how the body processes water and what the regulatory processes are before we just start consuming as much water as we can. So first, the first thing that we need to understand is how the body regulates hydration and that will sort of help to define what is hydration. So hydration is not just, you know, we drink water because likely we're just going to pass that water. So what sort of hydration are we looking for? Are we looking for systolic hydration, which is inside the cell? Do we want to have hydrated cells or do we want to have hydrated fluid outside of the cells? Okay. And because of our cell membranes, there's always going to be contention with osmosis. So we have the interior pressure of the cytosol, which is the fluid inside of the cell, and then we have whatever's outside of the cell. So um, we call this uh, we call this effect uh, Turger pressure. And so if we have um, if we have cells that are more hydrated then the fluid around it, then the Tugger pressure is going to indicate that water is going to try to leave the cell through osmosis. And if the opposite is true, the cells are dehydrated and the pressure outside of the cells is greater, then water is going to be trying to get inside the cells. Now, this, if there's too much pressure, it can be difficult on the cell membrane. We need a certain amount of pressure within the cell for other regulatory functions. So that's going to be rate limited on how much gets in the cell and how much water gets outside of the cell. So there are these transporters. There are these uh, transporters that regulate ions and the way that the cells regulate hydration is through sodium ions and potassium ions. And there's a, a transport protein that allows uh, either one to go to and from the cell membrane, which helps to either encourage osmosis or discourage osmosis. So we have three different So why do we have cell walls in the first place? Well, cell walls do a really good job of keeping our DNA and RNA inside of some sort of a confined space which leads to greater replication. So there was an evolutionary advantage to having cell walls and protecting those cell walls is going to protect the replication. So let's look at three different forms of, of cells and their classification by hydration levels. So first of all, we can have what would be like a dehydrated cell. We call this hypertonic. And 
the worry here that the osmotic pressure gets so low inside of this cell and everything gets so crammed together that the cell eventually dies. We have isotonic Isotonic means that it's at equilibrium with the fluid outside of the cell, which really doesn't happen very often because of Gibbs law. Things are constantly in in a state of motion, so we really don't we really don't uh, look at that too much. Um, and then we have hypotonic. And with hypotonic, like the cell membrane is just, you know, being uh, under pressure because of the, the high pressure of the cytosol inside of the cell. And the worry with the hypotonic cells is that the cells could lice or burst open because uh, the cell membrane wouldn't be strong enough to keep up with that pressure. So the body is the cells rather are trying to create equilibrium they're trying to go from here to here from here to here we never actually get here though this is sort of a sliding scale that goes back and forth and so we need to look at the factors that actually cause that to happen which is not necessarily just drinking water all the time there are other things that are way more important for hydration than the total fluids consumed and we'll go over that here in a little bit but yes the there are ions that regulate that osmotic pressure in the cell and we're dealing with sodium ions and potassium ions and the transport protein ATPase which transports out uh, three sodium and in to potassium giving us a net charge of minus one would be the difference inside of the cell. So let's say that that's the case for this um, hypertonic cell. What's going to happen with ATPase? Sorry, that's horrible. What's going to happen with ATPase is that we're going to transport out three this is N plus K plus uh, three sodium ions and in to potassium ions giving us so we have three plus two plus that gives us a charge of net one difference okay and this this occurs all day long and the, if you weigh yourself all day you can see your concentration of fluids changing and for for men we can see about a five to seven percent difference in 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 weight just by water weight every day which is an awful lot and for women it can be even higher and we'll, we'll talk about some of that later the other influence on Cellular hydration is, is uh, these classifications of hormones called mineral corticoids. And these mineral corticoids are designed to regulate the production of ATPase, uh, of sodium potassium ATPase. I need to make sure that I always disambiguate because there could, there's different types of, of that, of course. Now, ATP, of course, is a adenosine triphosphate. If you know anything about glycolysis or the Krebs cycle, it's how the uh, the body converts carbohydrates into energy, and then through lipolysis, lipolysis fats into energy. And so um, it does take energy, a lot of cellular energy, to do this. So we'll we'll, t we'll talk about a little bit later why some of the symptoms of of drinking water all day long can lead to fatigue and, and, and muscle weakness. But first, let's talk about the hormone response elements, or uh, HRE, that will predict whether or not this transport protein is being 
produced in the cell and join the membrane because if there's no transport protein, there's nothing to transport and then, you know, uh, the regulation of osmosis is going to be um, unregulated because perhaps it doesn't need to be regulated maybe or if there's some sort of a condition like Addison's disease or uh, some, something to do with overproduction of corticoids, maybe um, maybe there's 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 uh, an, issue, uh, an issue with edema or something like that going on. But RS, uh, the uh, HRE, the hormone response elements, will upregulate sodium retention. Meaning that the cells will hold on to their sodium and they will keep a, pos a net positive charge to prevent osmosis from occurring. So the most important mineral corticoid is aldosterone, which is a hormone that's made in the kidneys. Um, this hormone has a half-life of only 20 minutes. And so uh, once the kidneys produce aldosterone, you know, these regulatory factors happen fairly quickly. Um, and you can, you can kind of hack the aldosterone pathways. You see this a lot in combat sports where athletes need to make weight. Uh, you might see it in gymnastics too where there will be a phase called water loading um, to trick the body into thinking that there's a surplus of, of, of sodium and then you eliminate that sodium and then there's going to be a phase where you're going to shed water weight like crazy. Uh, this is a very dangerous thing to do. I, I don't recommend that anybody does it this way. If, if you're an athlete, cut the weight safely. And um, you know this can, can do a lot of harm to your kidneys. It can also do a lot of harm to your adrenal glands. Um, and you know you could get permanent damage to those. Well, you could get lasting damage to those. Let's just say that. Uh, I wouldn't say permanent. You can fix it, but it's just better not to do that. Um, you know, there, there was, uh, every once in a while you hear of a person dying from hyperhidrosis. So somebody who drinks too much water and dies. And most of the cases that are not um, due to some sort of underlying kidney failure, uh, underlying medical condition, just someone who's typically healthy that just goes around drinking water until uh, they, they end up dying. It's usually because they're not able to pass urine. Um, and so th there was this case where, a very unfortunate case, that, um, that there's like a radio station or something, and they were giving away a, a car. Uh, and, and the thing is, everybody had to keep their hand on the car. The last person to get their hand uh, to, you know, if, if you, you could give up by taking your hand off the car, walking away or whatever, um, and to kind of speed things along so it didn't take forever, they were giving people, they had to have people drink water. And so people were, were drinking glasses of water, glasses of water, and if they had to leave to go use the restroom, well, then they didn't win the car. So there was this lady that was just determined to win, and she kept drinking water, and then all of a sudden, you know, all of her cells became hypotonic and then psh, burst open, and, you know, that led to edema, pulmonary edema, she couldn't breathe, and then she died. And that's very unfortunate. Um, but any more, we see more cases of people dying through hyperhidrosis than we do through dehydration. And we'll go over some of those stats later on in this video. But anyway, the, the body through aldosterone will start conserving sodium and it will start to excrete potassium. Um, and so we'll, we'll have more sodium going into the cell and more potassium going out of the cell. And then once potassium gets in the fluid, we expel that fluid and we rid ourselves of that potassium. There are some other mineral corticoids like cortisol, um, which is a stress hormone. It's a uh, glucose steroid. And it's a hundred times less effective in cellular hydration is aldosterone, but it sort of does the same thing. It's something that's made by the adrenal glands and it's something that's 
important to know about because if you're in a highly stressed state, your body's going to start conserving um, sodium and you might see some water retention if you know, you're just under a lot of stress and your body's making a lot of cortisol. Progesterone is another hormone that can lead to water retention as well. Again, not nearly as efficient as aldosterone, but uh, progesterone will cause fluid buildup. This is why a lot of times if you'll see women who uh, go on the birth control pill, which is like a form of um, synthetic progesterone, they'll gain five pounds of weight. Uh, and that's because you know they're taking in that extra hormone and that will cause them to retain water. Now, usually what happens is over time, the body will adapt to that excess progesterone and will start down regulating aldosterone, but there may be a period of, of time where, where the body adjusts to that. Also in the menstruation cycles of women where they're producing more or less progesterone can also control um, fluid retention as well as you know, many of the women watching this video already know. So let's think about this. If you take the birth control pill and you gain five pounds of water weight, that's a lot, okay? That's almost two and a half liters of water. So picture two and a half liter bottles of whatever, Coca-Cola, one liter bottle, two liter bottle, half a liter bottle. That's how much one hormone can change your hydration levels. Okay, so way more than how much water we consume. So hormones make a huge difference. So it's interesting that when we're looking at mineral intake and how these minerals will affect our hydration, it's important to understand that potassium is much more important for membrane permeability than sodium, even though they both sort of balance each other out. Those ratios balance each other out. Um, and this is due to a couple of different factors. The, the first one is just Gibbs free energy, which we abbreviate Delta G. Um, this Gibbs free energy, just to give a quick overview of it, it, um, it sort of figures out where there's an, uh, a surplus and where there's a deficiency, sort of like entropy. Okay. So if there's something greater over here, an energy source greater over here, and there's something smaller over here, and there's some kind of, usually an enzyme, okay, then get delta G will be pointing in this direction, okay, or if it flips around then it goes the opposite direction, and that's sort of how entropy works in the body, we call this delta G. But in any case, um, with with the uh, potassium ions has a much greater effect on the Gibbs free energy than sodium does. Um, in the modern diets, we also consume, well, and even pretty much in every diet, we consume much more sodium than we do potassium. And so, uh, you know, that that's also why it seems to be that potassium seems to be the, the more important uh, ion for for membrane permeability and hydration. So it's important that in your diet you're getting enough potassium. You know, there's, uh, you can go look at, you know, any of the health data. Actually, if you, if you just download the MyFitnessPal app and start tracking your mineral intake, um, it's, you can see how, about how much potassium you're getting per day. And a lot of people don't get enough. Uh, supplemental potassium can be dangerous, especially with potassium chloride. If you're going to supplement, try to use a, a chelate instead of a, a salt um, so that uh, there's less risk of, of heart attack. If you get your uh, minerals too out of balance, it can really mess up your heart. So uh, be careful. Okay, so um, the MAPK pathway regulation, which... Um, what we talk about ATPAs and, and how it transfers fluid inside and outside of the cell. Um, we start looking at the regulatory pathways outside of that that 
uh, sort of the biosynthetic pathways that help to regulate that. And we come up with the MAP, MAPK uh, genetic cascade. And this is very interesting because um, it has a couple of implications that I think are important when it comes to um, hydration. And the first one is how reactive oxygenated species goes up when um, fluid enters the cells. So when we're um, kicking out the when we're sort of, you know, we're kicking out the, the potassium and getting the sodium to enter the cell um, and reinflating those cells, we end up with oxidative stress as a result of the cascade that regulates that transport. Okay. Um, and another thing that happens is this is also going to use up mitochondrial energy in the form of ATP. It's not a free exchange. It takes resources to be able to do this. And um, if you think about neurons, you know, all over the body, but especially in the brain, 75%, 75% of the ATP expended by neurons are involved in the regulation of this process. So if you're manipulating this by drinking water all day long, you're likely to have brain fog because this percentage is going to go up as a result of you sipping water out of your hydro flask all day long. Um, so you're you're going to have you're going to create more oxygen ox, uh, damage due to uh, reactive oxygenated species. You're going to use more ATP for something that you could use for something else. Um, in skeletal muscle, we see people who are overhydrated and they end up with muscle weakness because they just don't have the mitochondrial energy to, to move around very much and uh, that's, that's not a good thing. So um, one of the things that we can do is if you, know, if you feel the need to drink all the time, make sure that it's just not distilled water, make sure that we do have some some mineral intake in there, especially in the form of potassium. If we're consuming, you know, they say, oh, well, drink a lot of water all day long and put a dash of uh, Himalayan sea salt in it. Okay, well, we upregulate um, sodium, you know, and then the potential of sodium increases, and then we go with this back to delta G will then stimulate this pathway to make okay to go to here so we we put the sea salt in the water we change the osmotic pressure influences the larger cascade creates more transport then we end up with more um, oxidative stress loss of more ATP due to transport. So, yeah, that's maybe not the best advice. Um, maybe what we should do instead is consume something more like, you know, let's say we actually need to rehydrate. Let's say we're in, engaged in sport or we're outdoors, we're sweating a lot, whatever, you do a, a sauna. Um, you're going to have to have some mineral balance. You're going to have to have uh, some minerals in the water for you to absorb it. But if you actually need to rehydrate and not just drinking just for the sake of drinking, you're, you're going to need to have some potassium along with it. And it's going to need to be in that balance because we want, you know, the, we want all of the fluids to have an equal ratio, or not an equal ratio, but a balanced ratio of sodium to potassium ions. So let's look at an example of what this might look like. So let's take a let's take a 70 kilo male. Let's give him a name. Let's call him Fred. This will be a 
great name for our subject. Let's say that Fred um, has a total of 40 liters of fluid in Fred's body. Um, we can break this down it's by saying that we're, we, we could say that uh, let's say 28 is going to be units in cytosol and then let's say extracellular uh, let's just balance it out with 12 liters so we make 40 um, all right so this is this is Fred's this is Fred's uh, hydration makeup okay now we're, we're going to take a, a look at Fred's uh, daily life and see you know what he's intaking and what's coming out so let's say today um, Fred consumes um, I'll put the intake over here. Let's say that throughout the day, uh, Fred consumes um, 1.5 liters of fluid of some sort. Okay, it could be water, coffee, tea, whatever. Okay, let's say that Fred's getting. Um, 0.7 liters from food. All right, and um, you know, you eat food, vegetables are mostly water, fruits are mostly water. Um, a lot of meat that we eat is, is uh, mostly water. So we're eating food and we're getting water from our food. And then we have another Just in, um, in, in water oxidation, um, which basically, you know, if we hy hydrolyze uh, water to get the hydrogen ions, that's what happens. Um, and so, you know, we uh, are. In, in this in this process, we're actually combining hydrogen um, with oxygen to create water, and that that just happens in the body. Okay, so this is his intake. So we're going to have a total intake of two point five liters. Is that right? And then uh, let's look at this the output. Fred's output, okay? So we think of all of this um, as his intake, we're gonna think about all of this as his output, and then we're gonna look at how delta G deals with this um, for the regulatory response. So output, let's say we have 300 milliliters of water loss due to respiration. So just by breathing, you know, the we expel water vapor uh, with our breath. So we'll lose a little bit of that every day. And this is just Fred. You might lose more, you might lose less. It depends on your climate and you know what you're doing that day. Okay, let's say that we lose 800 milliliters through urine. Okay, so, you know, Fred drinks a liter and a half, but only urinates 800, and so um, the only the only we don't just rid all of our fluids by urine. There's other ways to do it too. Uh, stool, for instance, you know, let's say we have 250 milliliters of fluid in our stool. We have to have water in our digestive system to help move things along and get things going. So this total. Five 
five liters. So we're intaking 2.5 liters and we're only uh, outputting 1.35 liters. So the Gibbs free energy would indicate that we're consuming more fluid than we're excreting. So what's going to happen is with delta G, the body is going to stop producing aldosterone. And within 20 minutes, our body is just going to start ridding more water. So we're going to increase um, our respiration, increase urine, um, may increase stool, and uh, um, we also probably have uh, perspiration of some sort too. So, you know, we, um, you know, we're going to have probably increased perspiration as well. So we're, again, the osmotic pressure, if we don't do anything about this, if there's no regulatory system in place, what's going to happen is that we're going to increase the osmotic pressure um, because the, the fluid from the exterior of the cells is going to enter into the cells and we're going to start getting symptoms of of uh, increased cytosol pressure, which could lead to cellular damage. All right, let's say we change this up. Let's say we add back in perspiration, and for some reason, you know, we, um, we go out and sauna. So we went way up on this. So now we're gonna be 3.35 liters. So now we're dehydrated. So what's gonna happen now? Well, now the body is going to produce more aldosterone. We're gonna increase our, uh, our intake, our cellular intake of sodium. We can retain more water so that the cells don't dehydrate. Okay, now the Gibbs free energy is going in the opposite direction. So th these hormones make a bigger difference uh, because they respond to what's happening in the environment. And from an evolutionary point of view, you know, we're more, you know, as, as a species, we suffered more from dehydration, from not being able to find enough water uh, than we did from... Um, from having a surplus of water where we're drinking it all the time. And so our bodies are very good at being able to conserve water and uh, the hormones are very effective at keeping us hydrated and keeping us alive. Um, we can go for about three days without consuming water. Wouldn't recommend that, but it's possible. You know, you could still probably stay alive. But, you know, the, basically what this all boils down to from a medical point of view, is when we look at water loss, and sodium loss. Now, most of what we see medically today is going to be this. So the water that we're excreting is greater than the sodium that we're intaking. And this is um, going to be, you know, the only way that we dehydrate. So when we see patients that are hospitalized, just in total, just this is just a, a statistic on uh, total intake, patient intake in, in hospitals. 10 to 15% of hospitalized patients have uh, hyprotremia, which means their kidneys are overwhelmed. Um, and this is because of excess fluid consumption or hormonal factors like uh, aldosterone increase, you know, and too much water uh, because 
you you have aldosterone and then you have water and that's going to create you know uh, excessive hydration and and then uh, we, we end up with really bad symptoms you know where water fluids just start to collect in places and the organs don't work as well so the data would indicate that the problem is not that people are just not hydrated enough like some of the major health sites claim that we should be drinking water all the time because they, they say things like well if you're thirsty it's already too late or something like that you know it's ridiculous um, so you, if you start getting seeing people with headaches cramps nausea nervousness so why the nervousness why the the neurological symptoms uh, because of the increase in cortisol and uh, because the cortisol is being produced as a stressor to try to conserve some of that fluid along with the aldosterone and we also see um, that lack of ATP so bad decision making brain fog and that kind of thing so I recommend that you drink when you're thirsty and this will work for most people there are a couple of instances where people have hormone deficiencies and um, like for instance Addison's disease where the thirst isn't really an indicator of whether or not they're um, they're dehydrated uh, also in the in the very elderly population like 90 plus years of age uh, we'll see people within that demographic that also seem to uh, lose their sense of thirst and, um, with age and so they probably need to make sure they're getting enough fluids you know with with meals or whatever but for the vast majority of the population if you're not thirsty you don't really need to be consuming water um, now again if you live in a desert you know if you sweat a whole lot or, or something you know there are there are exceptions to the rule but you know these desk jockeys that I'm seeing with their hydro flash just clinkety clacking against their desks all day long they're not competitive athletes okay they're not out there on the field you know sweating for for four to six hours a day and training they're just you know typing away at their email or something and so uh, they don't really need to be consuming all of that uh, all of that water um, I'd like to close by talking about other mineral gaps that go along with this. We've been talking a lot about the, um, the, the two major ions, the sodium and potassium, but it's also important that we understand that magnesium is super critical in all, these, um, all the electrolyte balances in the body, and most people are deficient in magnesium. Most people need to supplement with magnesium, so make sure that you're supplementing with a quality magnesium supplement. Go to Fix Your Gut and read John Brisson's article on magnesium. It's an article kind of doesn't do it very much justice because it's so comprehensive. Uh, he did a really good job of compiling all of the information there about magnesium. But you know, get some glycinate. Um, you know, take it at night. Make sure you're getting enough. Again, use My Fitness Pal to see if you're getting enough. Uh, calcium can can be uh, can be. Uh, a factor too when it comes to hydration you know sometimes when you're over consuming you're, you're peeing out a lot of your calcium too and that can lead to osteoporosis over the course of years of doing that kind of stuff um, so are you getting a lot of calcium in your diet a lot of people are getting plenty of calcium in their diet some people aren't getting enough make sure to track it and then um, loss of sodium bicarbonate and so um, when we're having to excrete uh, sodium in the form of sodium bicarbonate because we're, we're overly hydrated um, it, that can also lead to metabolic acidosis so that, that could be a pretty bad condition down the road as well all of these things basically point to not over consuming water drink when you're thirsty that's my recommendation for how much water to consume every day I hope you like this video make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you can get reminders when we post a new update and uh, if you like this content hit the like button and if you have a question for me you can leave it down in the comments below have a great week